me, took blood samples, photos, took hair samples, took teeth impressions. There was no sign of entry, nothing was missing from the cash register or stolen. They found a mark on her body, they said it, it matched my teeth, and uh, so I was arrested. I look over my shoulder, it's a van load of police officers, full ride gear, guns drawn. I just got done delivering my mail that day, coming home to make New Year's Eve plans. Throw me on the ground. Uh, my, what I'm saying is, is that an innocent person can be executed. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody in America and the world. Number six, Sabrina Butler. Sabrina Butler Smith was a loving teenage mother when she was wrongfully convicted in the demise of her nine month old son, Walter, in Mississippi. And when I went in the room, he wasn't breathing. I put him to sleep and went jogging. In 1989, uh, um, I had my son, Walter Dean. When I got back to the house, I went in the apartment and went to the kitchen to get a bottle. She was later exonerated of all wrongdoing after spending six and a half years incarcerated, two of those years on the row. She was the first woman exonerated from the row in the U.S. When I was exonerated, that made me the first woman in the United States to be exonerated from death row. It was nothing that I did to cause his death. My son's death certificate still says he was, he was murdered. They found out that my son had heart problems, kidney problems, and chronic bowel syndrome, even though I was exonerated. On April 12, 1989, Sabrina rushed Walter to the hospital after he suddenly stopped breathing. Sadly, attempts to resuscitate her baby failed, and he perished the next day. I thought this was all a nightmare, that it would end. And um, they came back out, and they told me that they tried everything they could. I was sentenced March 8, 1990, and my death date was July 2, 1990. I was screaming when I ran into the emergency room, and they grabbed him from me and carried him to the back. The first day I went to prison, they had me shackled from my ankles, around my waist, and my wrist. Still in shock, Sabrina was questioned without an attorney or her parents present, and Walter's hereditary medical conditions were ignored. She endured her loss and grief alone in prison until her second trial proved her innocence. I served six and a half years on Mississippi's death row for a crime I did not commit. In 1989, I was convicted of killing my son. I am Sabrina Butler. When I made it to death row, I was 19 years old. Sabrina now lives in Memphis with three thriving children. Number five, Kirk Bloodsworth. In 1984, a nine-year-old girl was found lifeless in a wooded area, having been physically exploited strangled and beaten with a rock. Bloodsworth was arrested based on an anonymous call telling police that he was seen with the victim that day and an identification made by a witness from a police sketch shown on television. In 1984, a little girl by the name of Dawn Denise Hamilton was found brutally murdered, tan skin and skinny. He was described as follows, six foot five, curly blonde hair, bushy mustache, in 1984, my hair was as red as a fire club. The description of the perpetrator was six feet five inches tall, white man with curly blonde hair, a bushy mustache, skinny and tan. Bloodsworth was six feet, had red hair, and was well over 200 pounds. At trial, five witnesses testified that they had seen Bloodsworth with the victim. However, two of these witnesses had not been able to identify Bloodsworth during a lineup, but had seen him after the crime was committed on television. I am the first death row exoneree. I happened to spend about eight years, ten months, and 19 days in prison to be exonerated by post-conviction DNA testing. Testimony that Bloodsworth had said that he had done something terrible that day that would affect his relationship with his wife was presented at trial. Additionally, Bloodsworth mentioned a bloody rock during conversations with police. Though there was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime, Bloodsworth was convicted of slaying and exploitation and was sentenced to the row. Uh, my, what I'm saying is, is that an innocent person can be executed. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody in America and the world. In the early 1990s, Bloodsworth learned about DNA testing and the opportunities it could provide to prove his innocence. The prosecution finally agreed to DNA testing for Bloodsworth's case in 1992. The victim's shorts and underwear, a stick found at the scene, and an autopsy slide were compared against DNA from the victim and Bloodsworth. The DNA lab determined that testing on the panties excluded Bloodsworth and replicate testing performed by the FBI yielded the same results. Bloodsworth was released from prison in June 1993 and pardoned in December 1993. He had spent almost nine years in prison, two of those years facing the capital penalty. Number four, Anthony Ray Hinton. On February 25, 1985 and July 2, 1985, 
two fast food managers, John Davidson and Thomas Wayne Vason, were slain in separate incidents during armed robberies at their fast food restaurants in Birmingham. Uh, well, you know, uh, I was uh, cutting grass uh, in the backyard and, and I said, no, I do not. I said, but my mother have an old Smith & Weston. Uh, they took this gun and in America, if you don't have the money to hire a decent defense. A survivor of the third restaurant robbery picked a photo of Anthony Ray Hinton, then age 29, from a lineup, and the police investigated him. The prosecution's only evidence at the trial was a statement that ballistics tests showed four crime scene bullets matched Hinton's mother's gun, which was discovered at her house during the investigation. The gun hadn't been fired in over 25 years, said that it matched the bullets that they got out of the deceased body. You will be uh, convicted in America with no doubt. Uh, they asked me, did I have a owner firearm? Uh, these two detectives showed up and said they had a warrant for my arrest. No fingerprints or eyewitness testimony were introduced. Hinton was convicted of each of the two slayings and sentenced to his demise. Hinton was sent to the row where he was held in solitary confinement for nearly three decades. During his decades in prison, he was supported by his mother's faith in his innocence, as well as that of a longtime friend, Lester Bailey, who visited him monthly. Hinton's mother perished in 2002, never getting to see her son be proven innocent and set free. In 2014, the Supreme Court of the U.S. unanimously overturned his conviction on appeal, after which the state dropped all charges against him. Hinton was held on the state's end row for 28 years before finally being released in 2015. The court was unable to affirm the forensic evidence of a gun, which was the only evidence on the first trial. After being released, Hinton wrote and published a memoir, The Sun Does Shine, How I Found Life and Freedom on the Row in 2018. Number 3. Ricky Jackson Ricky Jackson was a teenager living in Cleveland, Ohio, when he was wrongfully sentenced fatally. He was a victim of wrongful conviction in the 1975 slaying robbery case of a money order salesman named Harold Franks. The sole evidence against Ricky and his co-defendants, brothers Wiley and Ronnie Bridgman, was the false, coerced eyewitness testimony of a 13-year-old boy named Eddie Vernon, who was to later play a central role in exonerating the three men. No physical or forensic evidence linked any of them to the crime, none of them had any prior criminal record, and defense witnesses provided all three with credible alibis. Nevertheless, all three were sentenced fatally just months after their arrest, later commuted to life without parole. In 2011, Cleveland Scene Magazine published a detailed examination of the case and highlighted the numerous inconsistencies in young Eddie Vernon's testimony and the absence of any other evidence linking Jackson and the Bridgmans to the crime. The Ohio Innocence Project filed a petition for a new trial on behalf of Jackson. Similar petitions were later filed on behalf of Wiley Bridgman and Ronnie Bridgman. In November 2014, Judge Richard McMonigal granted motions for a new trial filed by Ricky Jackson and Willie Bridgman and vacated their convictions. The prosecution then dismissed the charges against both of them and they were released. Ronnie was released later too. Ricky wound up serving 39 years, three months and nine days, the longest time in prison of any person exonerated in U.S. history. Number two, Damon Thibodeau. In 2996, Crystal Champagne's lifeless body was discovered in a horrible condition. A piece of red extension cord was wrapped around her neck. Thibodeau first became a suspect because of his familiar relationship with Champagne. He initially denied any involvement in the crime and agreed to take a polygraph. He was informed that he had failed the polygraph. After many hours of interrogation, he gave a recorded statement confessing to consensual and non-consensual intercourse with the victim and then to beating and slaying her. Only 54 minutes were recorded out of the entire nine-hour interrogation. Thibodeau's confession was inconsistent with the crime in numerous ways. For example, he stated that he used a white or gray speaker wire from his car to strangle Champagne, though it was a red cord. Although forensic examiners could find no evidence of semen in the victim's body, a detective theorized that an attack still could have occurred and that post-mortem maggot activity had consumed and degraded the evidence. Additionally, two eyewitnesses testified that they saw someone pacing near where the body was found. They both selected Thibodeau from a photo array and identified him in court. Despite any evidence, physical linking Thibodeau to the slaying, he was convicted and sentenced to the row in Louisiana. In 2007, DNA on the cord in the tree, which had tested positive for blood in the original investigation, revealed male DNA that did not belong to Thibodeau. Further evidence also proved he was innocent. 
He was released in September 2012 after 15 years on the row and a total of 16 years of wrongful incarceration. Number 1. Ray Crone On the morning of December 29, 1991, the body of 36-year-old Kim Akona was found nude in the men's restroom of a Phoenix, Arizona bar where she worked. Ancona had been fatally knifed, and the perpetrator left behind little physical evidence. And one day I was questioned concerning the murder of a local barmaid. I was interviewed and questioned by the police concerning her murder. The next day I was arrested for a murder. She was found stabbed to death in the men's bathroom by the owner. He took blood samples, photos, took hair samples, took teeth impressions. There was no sign of entry. Nothing was missing from the cash register or stolen. They found a mark on her body. They said it, it matched my teeth. And uh, so I was arrested. Blood at the crime scene matched the victim's type, and saliva on her body came from someone with the most common blood type. There was no semen and no DNA tests were performed. Investigators relied on bite marks on the victim's breast and neck. Upon hearing that Ancona had told a friend that a regular customer named Ray Crone was to help her close up the bar the previous night, police asked Crone to make a styrofoam impression of his teeth for comparison. On December 31, 1991, Crone was arrested and charged with slaying, kidnapping, and exploitation. All of a sudden I heard the screech of brakes, the sound of slamming doors, people yelling, freeze, don't move, you're under arrest. Arrest me, handcuff me, and charge me with murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. And kidnapping. December 31st, 1991, I look over my shoulder, it's a van load of police officers, full ride gear, guns drawn. I just got done delivering my mail that day, coming home to make New Year's Eve plans. Throw me on the ground. At his 1992 trial, Crone maintained his innocence, claiming to be asleep in his bed at the time of the crime. Experts for the prosecution, however, testified that the bite marks found on the victim's body matched the impression that Crone had made on the styrofoam, and the jury convicted him on the counts of slaying and kidnapping. He was sentenced fatally, and a consecutive 21-year term of imprisonment respectively. Crone was found not guilty of the incident. It was not until 2002, after Crone had served more than 10 years in prison, that DNA testing proved his innocence, and he was released on April 8, 2002. That's all for today, folks. We'll see you next time.